big silence. The big silence. Welcome back to the Big Simmons podcast. Thank you for coming back this week, and thank you for always sharing the episodes. Uh, I am so excited. We've been doing this podcast for over a year together, and we are one of the leading mental health podcasts out there. And anywhere you can listen to a podcast, you can find us. And speaking of that, when you listen to the podcast, I would love it if you can leave a comment on Apple Podcasts and a review. Because every month we are sending a VIP package to somebody, um, which will include Big Silence merch, maybe some Tone It Up merch. You'll get a box um, just for a thank you because it's so important to me and to everyone who really strives to end the stigma around mental health and open up these conversations. So this podcast is just one of the outlets we have for the Big Silence Foundation. And I'm going to read um, one review that came through this month. Uh, And thank you. It's from Admirable. So I know it's not your real name when you are leaving a review. So just DM at the Big Silence Instagram or send us an email and we will get that VIP package out to you. So Admirable says, I originally found Karina many years ago through Tone It Up and instantly loved her. Thank you. Uh, She was always bubbly, relatable, inspiring, and a fitness inspiration. However, over the years, as she shared her life experiences with such a genuine and intimate way, we got to know her more deeply, and now I have even more gratitude for Karina. As a mom of a son who thrives and struggles with mental illness, I am incredibly grateful to the big silence for all they do to change the narrative and break the stigma. No more silence, just healing. Thank you. You know, reading all of these comments and reviews really makes me keep going too. You know, uh, this is out of passion and purpose and um, it's... That's my goal is to help each other heal through these conversations that we're having here. Um, one other notice or PSA, <laughs> um, if you go to, we'll put a link in the bio, but I am starting an intimate group of live podcasts on Zoom once a month. And we're doing our first one in August. It's going to be myself and your favorite co-host, Bobby Goldstein. So this means that you can uh, you can go to the link, which again, in the podcast notes or at thebigsilence.com, and you can register. Uh, we ask for a small donation for the Big Silence Foundation and all of our efforts to be live with us in conversation. We're going to take all of your questions ahead of time so we have them, and then we will open up the room to um, back and forth conversation. So very intimate, very private, and then we, uh, will air it. So head over there, make sure you join us for the first live podcast on zoom. All right. So today's guest, Dr. Nejua Zabian, what a great conversation. Um, she has a book out called Conversations on Letting Go, Guidance, Meditations, and Exercises to Help You Live Authentically. Um, it is an audio book. So download that when you sit in your car, when you're going for a walk, when you're at the gym, listen to this. Uh, it's an incredible conversation about forgiveness, which I feel like I have a lot of conversations on this pod about forgiveness is it good? How much do you forgive? Or, you know, it's just, you know, we talk about all the universal challenges that we all struggle with on letting go and living our authentic life. Uh, she has a great story on how she even got here and why she wrote this book, why she does what she does. Beautiful poet as well. Um, so here you go. Enjoy the pod. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Nejua Zabian. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited for our conversation. I am too. I started listening to your audiobook, Conversations on Letting Go, a few weeks ago. And just as I'm like moving around the house or driving, I, I put it on and it really 
hit home with me on a few different topics. I know it's guidance and meditation and exercises to help you live authentically. And I think at this point in the world and where we are, everyone's trying to get more guidance um, to live authentically yes. and be happy. So I'm excited to dive into a few conversations here. And we talked prior to this about two topics that mm -hmm. I really wanted to dive into, uh, which was infidelity because I'm getting DMs um, about women asking about infidelity mm -hmm. and how to move through that. And then also toxic relationships. Yes. And those two topics are very much related, mm -hmm. I believe, uh, mm -hmm. in many ways. Not all toxic relationships have cheating in them and not all cheating happens because it's toxic. but I think for the most part, there is a huge overlap between the two. One of the most common questions I get from people who struggle with toxic relationships and infidelity is, how do I just let go of my need to explain to them how they hurt me? Or how do I make sense of why they did this? Maybe if I figure out the reason, it would make it easier. Maybe if I express myself to them and they hear me out, they'll understand how they hurt me. It's interesting because I got a message from someone this morning. It didn't have to do with infidelity, but it was about toxic relationships, toxic mm -hmm. family relationships. And she said, I wish I could just write them a letter and tell them all how they hurt me mm -hmm. and ask why. She wrote why in capital letters. And so I responded to her in a voice note and I said, I would definitely urge you to write the letter because your anger, your pain needs a healthy outlet and writing it out is a healthy outlet. You can decide later whether this is a letter that you would like to give them or not. That's not what you're deciding right now. Just write it all out. The second thing I said was, when you ask someone, why did you hurt me? There is an element of there has to be a reason, a justification for why someone chose to hurt me when really it's just someone chose to hurt me. That's a good enough reason for me to be upset with them. That's a good enough reason for me to say I no longer want this relationship with them. Mm -hmm. You don't need the excuse. You don't need the reason. You know what happened. You lived through it yourself. Whether they are aware or not aware of, you know, how you're feeling about it, that's not going to take away from the fact that they did what they did. So maybe you can give yourself that closure and say that I know what happened. I lived through it and I don't need them to validate or to acknowledge what happened. Right. right? So, so I have a question yeah. there. How do you identify if you're in a toxic relationship? I mean, if, you, you yes. know, <laughs> yes. you know, I actually talked about this yeah. in conversations on letting go, because yeah. I found that as I was speaking on toxic relationships, you know, you look out there and every speaker or author or thinker has a different way of defining toxic relationships. So it was important for me to make it clear what I view as a toxic relationship and that is a relationship that you cannot fully be yourself in and if you are you get punished or mistreated or disrespected or made to feel like you are too much basically before you walk into someone's metaphorical home you have to leave parts of yourself at the door before you walk in that mm -hmm. is a toxic relationship to your being and to your well-being uh, that's my definition. Yeah. And so like someone who you're in a toxic, toxic relationship for many, many years, mm -hmm. and maybe then at the end, they just ghost you, like they're mm -hmm. gone. And you're like, wow, out of all of those years, I knew something was off. So how do I then, let's go back to like, then how do you heal? Yes. How do you heal from someone who you were in a toxic relationship with, and then they ghosted you out of the blue. From my experience and uh, in speaking to so many people who've gone through something like this, the biggest struggle is 
I'm the one who should have put an end to that or or I did so much for this person and look at how they ended up treating me or it's a, it's an issue with the ego at this point mm-hmm. where you feel like you've invested so much of yourself even though what you were getting in return was the complete opposite of what you were giving you feel like you're owed something in return like who gives me back all of this stuff that I gave away and this takes me back to a very powerful defining moment in my own healing when I realized that it was more important to focus on what I was gaining by accepting the end as opposed to what I lost before that end happened. So if this end happens, what am I gaining? I'm gaining myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's way more important than gaining anything I gave. And the beautiful thing about giving if it's love if it's kindness if it's respect if it's anything good it's an indication of who you are and what your character is and what you stand for and it's also an indication that you are the source of what you give that means you are actually able to recreate it and regenerate it and this time give it to yourself so to begin healing there has to be a recognition that The pain you're experiencing is totally valid. You feel hurt. You feel betrayed. You feel like you gave away too much of yourself to the point where you're empty. Maybe you don't know who you are without being attached to someone. Mm -hmm. Just recognize all of that and say, this will be painful for a while. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between facing the pain when you don't think you should be going through it and facing it when you are prepared you know, it's going to be painful. So if you can anticipate the pain, which is very human, we all go through it, then instead of going back and relapsing every single time that pain comes, you say to yourself, I know that this is going to happen. This is a natural part of my healing. I just have to push through it and get through it. What do you mean when you say relapsing? Like going, Mm -hmm. is it going back to that searching person, for that begging yeah, that, them yeah or back to that pain or, or like finding you need them, a, a, reason. a new one yeah yeah mm-hmm. or or settling and yeah. saying you know perhaps uh, the decision that you made to ghost me was as a result of me deciding that I wanted to be myself and if what mm-hmm. it takes for you to not ghost me anymore is for me to not be myself anymore then I will do that that's a form of relapse a lot of people do it and if you are somebody who's listening, who's done it, that it doesn't mean that you're weak and it doesn't mean that you have no willingness to stand up for yourself or move forward with your life. It just means that you don't have the right tools and resources to survive and thrive beyond this toxicity. So instead of sitting there and judging yourself and saying, I, I know better, I should do better. Ask yourself, why is it that I am not able to do what I know I should do? Right. Like shifting your focus, you said in the audio book, shifting your focus from I need them to know what they did to me Mm -hmm. to be there for yourself and what you wish someone would say to you. Say it to yourself. Absolutely. And usually when we're seeking comfort from other people in our toughest moments, The number one thing we are seeking is for someone to say, I get it. That's it. That's all we're looking for. We're not looking for somebody to judge us. We're already judging ourselves. The comfort we are seeking is one that takes away that shame and that judgment that we already have towards ourselves. So wouldn't it be great if we could give that to ourselves first so that we're not dependent on others to give it to us? Yeah, I love uh, in your book, you say you're the only one that can fix what someone broke inside of you. Absolutely. Because this is, again, one of the most powerful things that just changed my life completely. When somebody breaks something within you, you want them to put it back together because you think they're the only ones who can make the pain go away because they're the ones who inflicted that pain. And I say, if you trusted someone with your whole being and they decided to break you, 
why would you trust them in putting you back together? It just doesn't mm-hmm. make any sense. Right. You don't Someone need that, that closure. You, no, you don't need that closure because people show you who they are through their actions, not just through their words, not just through the memories of who they were, not just through the good times. Sometimes you can have 99 good memories with someone or good moments with someone. And there is one event that happens that just negates all of that. It takes away the intention of everything that came before. It makes you question whether that was genuine, whether it was real. But many of us forget that one time because those 99 times felt so good. So it's very important when someone breaks you in some way or breaks something within you, betrays you, lies to you, disrespects you, says something about you that's not true. It's very important for you to not put the healing, your healing, in the hands of someone who caused you the disease or the symptoms that you need to heal from. So tell me how you got into the work that you do. (laughs) <laughs> but there is something deep in there where I, I know because I work in the mental health space because of my own healing and growing up with my schizophrenic mother. And, the, you know, that's why I like to give back um, because it fulfills me. But what is your story? I started writing about 10 years ago. My first book was self-published about seven years ago. So it began as a way for me to make sense of myself and the world around me. And um, the form it took was I had just started teaching and I had students who had just arrived from a war-torn country. And I saw the struggle that they were going through to fit in and belong and raise their voice and figure out what their place is in this world. And so I started writing short pieces to help them you know, feel empowered and feel like they don't have to keep quiet about the struggles that they're going through. And uh, I started sharing those writings with them. Their teachers started seeing them, parents started seeing them. And then everyone was like, you need to put all of these writings in one place. So as I was trying to help them heal, I was helping myself heal because I arrived in Canada at 16, even though I'd visited many times before the move happened when I was 16 years old. So I had lived my life in what I always describe as black and white from the age of 16 until about 22, until I started teaching. And I realized that I didn't heal my 16-year-old self. I didn't have Mm -hmm. someone to speak for me or to empower me when I was that young. So now that I was doing it for my students, I was also doing it for my 16-year-old self. So that's how it started. And there was never an intention for it to be a book. Mm -hmm. The book came when everyone said, we need all of these writings that you are posting on Facebook or on your blog in one place. And so I self-published and, you know, the rest is history. But writing continues to be my way of healing and my way of also helping others heal. So that's where it comes from. Is there a trauma that you speak about that you can share? (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, There are many. (laughs) And actually, in Conversations on Letting Go was the first time that I completely opened up about certain sessions that I had um, where my current therapist, uh, she has a somatic healing approach. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I talk in detail about times when I was releasing certain trauma responses from my body and how, you know, I found myself in going back to certain memories, you know, getting into the fetal position, like I wanted to protect myself, like my, Mm -hmm. my hands were in fists and they were around my arms were like hugging my chest, but not really hugging because my hands are in fists. It's more of a protective position that I was taking and my knees were up to my chest and and realizing that my body has the ability to tell me and signal to me how to heal Mm -hmm. it and that when a trauma response gets trapped in your body when you don't release it in the moment which happens to so many of us right you go through something extremely traumatic but 
you kind of you numb it out in the moment right, you avoid it's just, it it's so big right so you just do whatever it takes at the time to get through it right and then which is why yeah sorry go yeah. ahead and then we're then when you're you have that trauma response again there's a lot of avoidance and so how yes. do you move through it and feel it and heal yeah I think a big part of it is deciding that you want to do that. And again, anticipating that it's not going to be easy and also anticipating that your body will do what's familiar to it. So if you normally go into fight or flight or freeze or fawn, whatever the response that you normally go to Mm -hmm. or your your coping trauma Mm -hmm. response, that it might happen for a little bit and then you have the ability to tell yourself I'm falling into this for me it's freeze I freeze mm-hmm. um and for anybody listening if freezing doesn't mean that you just sit there and you're not moving at all like you are still existing in this world around you you're still functioning but your body feels like it's trapped and like mm-hmm. there is nothing you can do to change the current situation that you're in you kind of submit to silence um whether that silence means that you don't speak up for yourself like you could still be talking to those around you but you're not standing up for yourself like that that's the um that's what that trauma response looks like to me and what it might look like to you because you might say no like yeah I numb it but like you know I'm still myself and I'm still laughing and whatever you could still be in that freeze response because you're not actually dealing with what happened at the moment you're you're completely avoiding it so um i begin with that recognize that um you might go into the response for a little bit before you clue in and make the decision that you're going to do something different um and decide that you would like to do something different that you would like to take the steps to start trusting your body and telling you what it needs for it to release that response bit by bit. And you might release a little bit today, 1%. Tomorrow it might be 2%. In a few months, you might be completely, you know, through it. And you can look back at it and say, wow, I fully released that. Like now it doesn't really exist anywhere because I gave it, I gave my body the ability and the tools to, and the trust to say what happened to me defined me for so long. But I see now that it, it's just something that happened to me and I mm-hmm. can push it outside and talk about it. There was one time, I'm just going to more practical stuff right now. One time when I messaged my therapist and I was feeling, so what happens with trauma, and I'm sure you know this, is this is who you truly are. I'm mm-hmm. holding one hand up, my left hand, and my right hand is, that's who your survival mode um, person or existence is so there's your authentic self and then there's the self that you need to be to survive and so a lot of times those two selves don't coexist because if you are fully authentically yourself then this survival mode self it doesn't serve a purpose anymore because you don't need it if you're in an environment where you can fully and authentically be yourself you don't need to be in your survival mode so when you feel like you're out of alignment, there's a blurriness. You just, you feel like mm-hmm. there's something going on, like a fogginess, but you can't really explain it. But what's happening is you're out of alignment. Like the, what, the way that you are existing versus the way that you actually should exist based on who you authentically are and not just the way you should exist, the way you really want to exist because we all have that hardwired need to be authentically ourselves and to be accepted and loved and welcomed as we are. So when that misalignment happens between the two, it's like there's a separation between who you are and the way that you are currently existing, the person that you are in a way pretending to be. And so I was feeling that way one day. I was driving and I stopped and I texted my therapist and I said, what are some ways that I can snap back into myself? I literally Mm -hmm. like clapped. Like, what are some ways that I could snap back into myself? So if you're listening, and I also share some of these strategies and conversations on letting go, 
some of the things that you can do are jumping up and down, tapping, like move your body in some way, tap your forehead, you know, go all the way down to tapping your arms, your chest, your Didn't you say that you would tap your throat? Because I'm I'm trying to get to what your trauma was. And I believe it was something without having a voice. Not being able to speak up and say, you know, this hurt me or Mm -hmm. what you did over here. Like it really uh, damaged the trust that I have for you or this is not what I want. And that really goes back all the way to my childhood. There's one story I shared where um, I was at my uncle's house and um, all of my cousins got gifts. It was the night before a very big celebration that we have and they all got gifts and I was the only one who didn't um, because I wasn't like an, like a part of the core family. I was just a cousin, but uh, I was living with them at the time. and they all went downstairs for family time and I wasn't included in that. And I would have been about eight years old Mm -hmm. and I can still see myself exactly where I was sitting and just thinking like, why can't I have that? Whatever it is that they have love, Mm -hmm. feeling embraced, feeling like someone cares about making me happy, all that stuff. So it goes all the way back to those early memories that I have where I couldn't raise my voice and say, this is not fair because I, I literally couldn't put words to it. I just internalized. If that good thing that I really want isn't happening to me, there must be something about me that, you know, because the common denominator in all of these times when I couldn't raise my voice was me. So yeah. when you trust those who are, older than you to make the right choice and they don't then you internalize that there must be something wrong with you so it goes all the way back to that and um so now anytime that I feel like there's a really powerful truth that I know I live by that I know I believe in but it just it I feel like if I say it I'm exposed in some way or I'm going to be punished in some way or whatever it is I I immediately start feeling this like Mm -hmm. like this big lump in my throat, like it's stopping something from coming out. So I I often will tap my throat or I will like massage it or um, my therapist is incredible at stuff like this. Like she's gotten me to a point where I understand that I can step into releasing that trauma response and I have the right to walk away from that at any moment so I can walk in for a minute and I can walk in for 10 I can walk in for 10 seconds or for three hours it depends on how comfortable I am so I always speak to the part of me that's very scared of releasing this trauma response because it's protective right it wants to protect you in some way that's how you've survived your whole life so it's like I speak to it and I say you know, I I want to give you the opportunity to say what it is that you're scared of, or Mm -hmm. I want to have a conversation with you. And every single time I've spoken to the part of me that, for example, decided not to speak up, Mm -hmm. I feel so much more in harmony with myself Mm -hmm. than I did before, because there is always a part of you that rejects the parts of you that protected you because you resent them you say I wish I was stronger I wish I could do this I wish I could say this I wish this 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 in a way you're rejecting the parts of you that have protected you and helped you survive throughout the years so it's it's so important to tune in and see what signals your body's sending you and your the tapping or the hug that you give yourself or the jumping up and down or taking a cold shower, all of that stuff, what it's really doing is telling your body, I'm listening to you. Tell me what I need to do next. Mm -hmm. So your healing kind of unfolds. Like imagine a rose that's like closed up and it's opening. That's how your healing happens. It's bit by bit, but overall you're, you're blooming into it. Yeah. I feel it's so important to share that healing is a process because I lived in trauma for 30 years and 
and, you know, and toxic relationships and all that. We're constantly healing. Let's just admit that. But the interesting thing is through, I feel like maybe we're very similar in the way that this in my throat is where it would just, I would feel my trauma, not um, having the ability to speak up. And now it's very different. I haven't had that throat tightness in years Mm -hmm. now by doing EMDR and talk therapy and all of the the work and the the cold plunges or cold showers and meditation and all these things that are very healing and um, gaining that confidence. And I feel like you probably from not being heard and then now you have this voice through poetry and writing Mm -hmm. and you have so much to say and uh, a confidence comes with that. And I've Um, as a very shy young girl and growing (laughs) into the confidence like I understand that and I think can you like take someone through a little tapping experience of how to and I do that still like sometimes when I just get in my head I'm like tap tap (laughs) like it Mm -hmm. really really helps it does I mean I would you have to tune into your body and see where you feel any kind of tension. So let's say um, there's one particular experience that you're having a hard time letting go of. Let's Mm -hmm. say it's the moment you found out that someone was cheating on you. I talk about that in conversations on letting go as well. I got so many questions. I I want to dive into that next. And yeah. yeah. So, so what, many people do is they kind of block out that entire thing happening and they label it as this really painful thing and I just need to get past it I just need to throw it behind me and you know you might go on with your life for a couple of years and distract yourself with new people and new experiences but that pain is still there waiting to be felt it's stored somewhere inside of your body even though you numbed it so to begin healing it I talk in conversations on letting go specifically. I say, you don't necessarily have to go to the exact moment that you found out if it's that scary, because Mm. for many people, it's terrifying. You don't want to relive that pain. Go back to a few minutes before what was going on inside of your body or go back to um, that moment but just say I'm just gonna go there for a few minutes I'm not I'm not going to allow myself to just experience the whole pain of it I'm just gonna go as comfortable as I am what's going through your body like close your eyes and tune in and you'll immediately feel as you're thinking back to that experience tension somewhere or some kind of uh the movement in your body for me one of the most common movements is my hands go into fists like I want to fight there's anger Mm -hmm. there's things I want to say there's ways I want to protect myself there's um also in a way feeling helpless because when you do this it, it is a way of closing up on yourself so notice what's going on just tune into it you don't have to label it you can say what it feels like and for me, what normally happens is the more and more I relive that experience and I'm fully aware of what's going on in my body, I will feel like my body's heating up. And then I ask myself, what would I tell myself as somebody who loves me in that moment? Mm -hmm. Like about what I'm going through or what would I say in that moment? How would I express my anger? How would I express my frustration? How would I express that I'm betrayed. And I've done this before. I sat there with my therapist and I addressed the person who hurt me, you know, to my therapist as my eyes were closed and I'm fully tuned into the sensations that are going on throughout my body. And it was like, I got so hot. I was sweating. Mm -hmm. And then, as I said, I'm angry because you did this. I'm angry because you lied about this. I'm angry because the more and more I did that, my body started cooling off and shaking Mm -hmm. and like I broke a sweat and then at the end it just it was this tingly feeling and it went away and then all that tension was gone um and now that I'm I'm thinking about that experience in particular I found at certain points that I was soothing my arms not by tapping but by going like this like just stroking them up and down 
because I felt like I needed that. So that's one way that you tune into your body and allow it to release a response that was trapped inside because you were too scared to actually feel things because you thought if I feel this, there's no way I could survive through it. So I would rather just numb it, distract myself and put it behind me. Um, that's oh. one way. Yeah. What's another? <laughs> I, or I another like, way. Yeah. Yeah. Go through that first. And then... now, now I'm thinking of, you know, other times when I've, I've done this. So um, your chest and the way that your breathing happens when you are thinking back to certain experiences also can tell you a lot. So uh, when we talk about, for example, panic attacks, they don't start mm -hmm. right away. You begin mm -hmm. with the, like, I can't catch my breath. Your breath becomes shorter and shorter. That's a common trauma response that people have is that their breathing will change. Mm -hmm. They will feel like their lungs can't fill up with air the more and more they think about a certain experience. And so you might feel that tension in your chest, like, like it's, it's the, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like your chest collapsed on itself and it's very tense. And oh, yeah. it, when oh, you know. breathe, right? Yeah. <laughs> when you breathe, you feel like your lungs literally cannot fill up with air. You just yeah. feel like you're just like, and so what does that tell you when you tune into it? I always close my eyes because it helps take away from other stimuli around me and it helps me fully focus on what's going internally. And so when I talk about my chest, like I, I might put both of my hands over my chest and start asking myself, what is it that feels like constriction? That's the word I was looking for. Like my chest is constricted. Like, what is that about? Um, and just start asking yourself these questions and things will come to you. Like yeah. you will get the answer. It might tell you some, your body might tell you something like, well, we feel this way because we feel like we're suffocating like that environment that we were in or that relationship that we're talking about, whether it's a family one or a romantic one or a work one, we felt suffocated, like we couldn't be ourselves. Okay. So what would in a moment like that take the suffocation away? For you, it might be speaking, like actually mm -hmm. saying words to say, don't do this, don't do that. Or right, I'm not okay with I this. Feel. I'm not comfortable with this. Right. Yeah. This is how I feel. And, For, and people who aren't used to you speaking up, they don't like that. But oh, they don't. <laughs> they do not like that. And there's a, it's really, really important to be gentle with yourself as you go through that. Because remember the relapse we talked about? Mm -hmm. It also happens when you do set a boundary as well. Because you might set a boundary and then based on the guilt that you feel or based on those around you not liking it, you might relapse and say, mm -hmm. I don't want this exclusion that I'm feeling. So I'm going to, or this punishment that I'm feeling. So I'm going to just go back. withdraw and go back. Okay. So it's very yeah. important for you to recognize that that's a very, very natural part of the reaction that you will get when you no longer serve the same purpose in other people's lives. Yeah. So like I said, for you, the response might be speaking. Hmm. For someone else, the response might be taking certain actions like withdrawing your energy from those around you or mm -hmm. uh, going to a completely new place for every person there is a way to make that constriction and suffocation go away so and you'll notice that as you are d imagining that your chest will expand and when it starts expanding you'll feel like you can breathe in fully your lungs fill up with air you're breathing out that's a way that you are showing your body that if you trust yourself, you can get yourself to a place where you're living in that expansion. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I know for me, if I'm having that anxiety, it's yeah, breath and saying to myself, you are safe. You are alive. Yes. You are here getting moving. Like you said, moving around, turn on some music, go dancing, get in some cold water, whatever it is to like get you out of that. And, and for me with panic, it used to be like in my chest, but now it's my stomach. And that's another like the nauseousness, but I know, yes. I know how to work through that now. And 
Um, can we talk about in um, conversations on letting go, you talk about forgiveness and I want to go back yes. to that infidelity because we haven't mm-hmm. talked a ton about infidelity on the podcast. Uh, yes. That forgiveness of letting go, but then mm-hmm. perhaps someone who was was the person who was, you know, the cheating um, mm-hmm. and moving through that and found, finding the why. I mean, I, I would assume some people, they don't really care and there's ego and then you move on, but then mm-hmm. sometimes you do it and you have a, a, a guilt for yeah. and a, for many, many years and you hold on to that guilt. And I, mm-hmm. I do know some people and that guilt is so heavy. You're like, I was in a wrong, I was not in a right headspace. I was going through so much and I did this, but I love my partner. Like, how do we move through this or how do we let it go? And separate? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I feel like there is quite a bit of pressure out there to forgive mm. and people think they can't heal unless they forgive. And the definition of forgiveness that they've always known is that if I forgive, then that means it wasn't that bad. It didn't affect me as badly as it did. And, um, you know, it it shouldn't have caused that kind of reaction within me. My definition of forgiveness is that you are no longer controlled by what happened to you. You decide to move forward from it. You can always acknowledge Mm -hmm. that it was so bad every time you think back to it but you've made the decision to move forward from it. That's the distinction I would make with forgiveness. You don't have to ever tell a person who hurt you, I'm okay with what you did, or I'm over it, or it's been such a long time ago, I'm okay with it. You don't ever have to say that or think that or feel that. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is a choice to just move forward with your life and no longer allow the pain that someone chose to put you through to be this heavy weight on you. They are the one who put you through it. They are the source of it. You are the one who carried it and reacted to it. And it it created some kind of a reaction within you that maybe said, um, I won't trust people easily anymore. That's a pretty good reaction because that's teaching you that um, people need to earn your trust. But many times we struggle with letting go of who we were before the pain happened. You'll often hear people say things like, I I just miss how happy I was before. I miss how naive or innocent I was before. I want to go back to that. And so a big part of forgiveness is 100% radically accepting that you cannot go back to the person you were before that infidelity or that cheating or that betrayal that happened you simply can't Mm -hmm. if you are wishing for yourself to go back to who you were before then you are wishing what happened away but it's not just the event itself it's everything that you learned from it and it's also everything that it's changed within you Mm -hmm. obviously this is not to say because i i don't agree with the school of thought that says that everything happens for you I don't agree with that you can't tell somebody who went through for example uh, a sexual assault that happened for you you can't say that to someone you can't tell somebody your pain you know look at all the positives that's not what I'm saying at all but what I'm saying is when you live in denial and say I want to go back to who I was before And that big event that actually happened, it's not going anywhere. But you are living in resentment and in hope that if this thing could go away, everything would be fine. But Mm. that's not realistically going to happen. So accept that with whatever it is that happened, there is a new you that might have tender parts and fragile parts and sensitive parts and strong parts and wise parts and there's going to be a whole new you as a result and you don't want to be rejecting that whole new you because there are already enough people out there who are rejecting Mm -hmm. that you you need to not be one of them so in more practical terms I know this would help if somebody's listening but in more practical terms I think you have to give yourself permission if you've gone through an experience of infidelity 
to decide what the conditions are if you do choose to forgive someone um, move forward from what they did to you if for example that means that they stay in your life you have the right to decide that you have the right to decide the frequency and intensity of your interactions with them if those exist based on your you could forgive say I'm moving forward from this but I never want to see you again I never want to speak to you again or you could forgive and say we can continue this relationship because you want to continue it or because and then if your partner is willing to do the work with you but here are the things I need to reestablish trust between the two of us you get to decide those conditions because what I often see in relationships is the person who committed the infidelity might say things to the other person like mm -hmm. you just need to trust me mm -hmm. but those yeah. are only words because yeah. you also need to show me that you are trustworthy yeah. through your actions so you might decide if you're the person who has cheated on to say i would like to be able to have access to your phone that's a condition for me rebuilding trust if that's what it takes for you to feel like you can rebuild trust with the person that you're with, you are more than valid in requesting that kind of thing. Or I would like to know uh, when you get to a place and when you leave, you just let me know. Those are things that people often get scrutinized for wanting and they'll right. say things to you like you're being insecure. Yeah, no, why don't you being trust insecure. me? And then the, the person who needs yes. to regain the trust is angry exactly. because they yeah. feel like they're being watched, and that, and then there's this yes. projection, and and yeah. So anyone going through to anyone going through that, here's a line you can use. I'm not insecure. I went through a situation in my relationship that was unsafe and that was insecure. So don't take the blame in on yourself because you're the one who experienced something that shook that foundation of trust that you had. You're standing on a shaky foundation. Mm -hmm. So that person, if they want to continue the relationship with you, they need to hold your hand as, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the work is on them to make that foundation secure, steady, and safe moving forward. So Absolutely. don't fall for that blame. I full heartedly agree with that if they really still want to be with you and want your your forgiveness and to yes. move forward it, it's going to take a lot of work thank you um i've really enjoyed this conversation any last minute tools i feel like you've shared so much <laughs> of what we can do through meditation through tapping through uh, therapy and well yeah conversations on letting go has quite a bit of reflection yeah meditations that I walk you through so I would urge you to listen to those um, and you can always just click on the meditation if that's all you want to hear or the guided exercises I highly recommend them also listening because conversations on letting go is an answer to questions that I got submitted from people who followed my work so I urge you to listen to those questions because yeah. It will help you feel so much less alone and see that your experience of pain is universal, not in a way that minimizes what you're going through, but in a way that says there's millions of people out there going through the exact same thing that you're going through. Listening to it, it's literally a therapy session. Because <laughs> I love how you like break it down and you're like, now close your eyes. And yes, this. that's like, what I wanted. It's that's an what experience. I wanted. Yeah. Like just you know, get the book, the audio book, and we'll put all of the links in the show notes of Perfect. where to find you and for the book and everything. And Wonderful. I'm going to finish the book. It literally, um, it's been so soothing for me to listen to as I've, you know, most of us, I would assume have all gone through toxic relationships and injustices and external perceptions and just working through all that and again like you said not like knowing you're not alone like this this is life this is like yes absolutely we all have gone through stuff letting go is one of the most universal things that we all struggle with so take a deep breath and whatever it is that you're going through there is a way to let it go because ultimately you want to live a life that's authentic to you and you can't live authentically when something 
that is not yours is weighing you down. Yeah. Again, thank you so much for coming <laughs> on the Big Silence podcast. Thank you for having me. The Big Silence. The Big Silence. The Big Silence.